good morning and welcome as we study today a brand new book, chapter one of Exodus. Now, Exodus is a continuation of what we just finished in Genesis. The story continues, although there's a gap of several hundred years between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. But we're going to see that the theme is initialized in the very first verses as we continue on with the family of Israel. And it says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. There's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. There's Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, and Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, some of the translations say that their numbers could have been 75, but that could have also included the, uh, the family of Joseph as well. But there's a note there that it says that these went with Jacob to Egypt. Jo- Joseph was already there. Now, why does it continue to list the names? Well, I think this is because as they rehearse the names, it keeps them from being lost or forgotten. And we have in the pages of scripture a very accurate account of the history of God's chosen people, the Israelites, as they were rehearsed and they were told over and over again so that they would not be forgotten. And we have a very clear line way back to the beginnings of these these tribes and families. It says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increasing in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Now, this is a a fulfillment of the promise that had been made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the numbers would be like the stars of the sky. And the, the words that are used in the Hebrews really emphasize that because some of the words could be translated as as a throng or a multitude or even a swarm. But that's the the magnitude of the families that were born. It says, Then a new king, who to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Okay? So there would have been a succession of kings of pharaohs that would be there. And this one was many years after. For example, do we know who was ruling in England uh, 250 years ago? Well, we could find out. But what would we know about them? Well, really nothing. So this is the situation that came with the Pharaoh that, that grew up at that time and came into power. He really had forgotten everything. And that's the danger of things that we go through as, as a church, as a people, as a country, that if we don't remember what has happened, then it will be lost to us. And that's why contemporary historians fill such a great role in our lives. It says he he knew nothing of Joseph. It says, look, he said to his to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Well, here we see that Pharaoh is operating from a position of fear. There is no basis that we can see for his fears. And many of the rulers at that time were operating out of a a position of fear. They feared that someone would rise up and take their position. And that's what happened many times, that the way to to get rid of a king was to kill him and the next one in line would come up and so on and so forth. But there, there's assumptions that are made here. He says, if war breaks out. Well, there is no, no thought that the war was going to break out. He says, they will join our enemies. Why would he assume that? Uh, they will then leave the country. Well, eventually they're going to do that anyway. But here they are in this place. Now, why do you suppose that uh, the people of Israel were multiplying so greatly in the land of Goshen in Egypt? Well, one of the commentators suggests that that's because if they had multiplied as a nation back in Canaan, they would have intermarried with the people of that land. And we see that that was actually the case. 
that uh, there was some intermarriage that was taking place even when they were still there. And they would not have been a pure nation. They would have not had their, their national identity the way they should. But in Goshen, in Egypt, they were able to multiply and they were able to maintain their purity as a nation, not intermarrying, not taking the foreign gods as theirs, but worshiping the one true God. Now, there was influence that we will see uh, of the Egyptian gods, but predominantly they were the people of God. And so here Pharaoh was operating from a position of fear. And aren't you glad that we don't have to operate from fear? God has said in, in Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He says in First John that he who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And that's what Jesus came to give us. He came to give us perfect love, personified the, the person of God in flesh. God is love, it says in First John. And so here Pharaoh is operating from another power source. It's not the power of God, it's the power of the enemy. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. So here, what do we see? We see that fear will give way to wickedness, and wickedness will give way to persecution. And that's the way that Pharaoh was operating. He was going to make them his slaves. He was going to dominate them. And one of the ways of intimidation is to make the other person that you're afraid of, afraid of you. We see that in the New Testament as well with the Pharisees. If they were ever accused of something, they would throw it back on the people. And if they were accused of something, they would then counter-accuse the people of something. We see that in the John chapter uh, 9 where the man was born blind and, and they were accusing him of things. And, and he says to them, well, do you also want to be his disciples? And they threw it back again says, you're all together in your sins. And so instead of answering any charge, they continued to lay more charges of their own. It says, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. Now fear is one level. Dread is another level where it begins to consume them. And so they their answer was treat them harder and harsher, and a heavy and heavy hand. And they treated them, it says, ruthlessly. It said they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Puah, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. And so this was Pharaoh's attempt at controlling the growth and the power of the Israelite nation. Okay, midwives, and here, here we see two of them. Their, their names were Shipra whose name means beauty, and Pua, whose name means splendor. Now, some think that they possibly uh, represented uh, a group of people. They may have been overseers of the midwives, because it's, it's really tough to think that there was only two midwives in the entire land of Goshen that would be looking after this, this multiple, growing, uh, fruitful nation. But whatever the case, these are the two that are mentioned. And the instruction was given to them, okay, when you're on the birthing stool, um, if you see it's a, a, a boy, you're supposed to kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let him, let her live. It says, uh, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king summoned of, of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? Okay, so it's obvious. It's obvious that, that after a couple of years, they could see that the boys were still growing and they were still being produced, even though 
they should not have been according to Pharaoh's decree. But these two midwives feared God. And even as the disciples said, when they were brought before the Sanhedrin says, we ought to fear God rather than man. And so he says, why have you done this? Well, here's the answer that they gave. The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Now, some think that they, they lied to Pharaoh. But others, maybe this was actually true. Maybe the, the Hebrew women did give birth. There's no indication in Scripture that it was a lie. And maybe they're just reporting the condition of things to Pharaoh. says, they're not like the Egyptian women. Now, that would indicate that the Egyptian women were more delicate and more pampered and not as strong. And we see that because of the, the forced labor, the Israelite women were very strong. It says they give birth before we even get there. And so that could have been a true statement. And the other may also have been true, that they were not putting the boys to death because they, they feared God. Either case, the nation continued to grow. God's plan was still being uh, fulfilled. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. So there we see the natural event, the natural flow, where the nation continued to grow. But then that's not all. Because of their fear of God and their faithfulness to God, here's what God did. It says, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Now, it's thought that many of the midwives were childless, and that's why they entered the profession of being a midwife, to help others with uh, their births. But here we see that even God was gracious. And we saw back in Genesis how God was able to open wombs that had been shut up and dead for, for years. And now God was blessing the midwives because of their faithfulness and gave them families of their own. So they also became part of this great nation. Well, then Pharaoh made, gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So by this, he was trying to stamp out the growth in one generation. In just, you take all the boys away, and you take away all of the, the seed that would be there to propagate a nation. Well, that actually happened for a while, where some of the, the uh, Hebrew boys were thrown into the river and drowned. But as we pick up next week, we're going to see that even this decree set the stage for what was going to be the, uh, the life of the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. As we pick it up, Lord willing, in chapter 2, we'll see how God used even this terrible persecution to set the stage for what he was about to do. Pray with me today. Father, thank you so much for your word to us today. And thank you, Lord, that over the centuries and the millennia, you have been faithful to people who are faithful to you. So, Lord, allow your spirit to once again touch our hearts and lead us into your truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today for our first study in the book of Exodus. May you have a blessed week. May God richly bless you. And we look forward, Lord willing, to seeing you next week. Thank you.